When top wrestling heel Nick Khan said, yeah, we're changing NXT because Vince doesn't get it, wrestling fans the world over poured their monster energy drinks on the floor and said a prayer for their fallen friend. The end of an era, a farewell to that familiar black and gold and a period of mourning because when NXT was on song, it was arguably the best and most enjoyable wrestling brand in the game. More than just a developmental territory, NXT blended the raw untapped talent earmarked for major success within WWE with, well, Primera Ring of Honor. In doing so, they created a show that was a breath of fresh air compared to the predictable staleness of WWE's main roster. But at the end of the day, it was still developmental, and for all of Triple H's proclamations that NXT was the third brand, in the eyes of the average WWE fan, it really wasn't. Call-ups were a consistent feature, and when NXT's best were called up, it created ripples of excitement. Then, in later years, groans of worry. And then, finally, screaming night terrors. Therein lay the problem of promoting NXT as this headline-grabbing, arena-filled brand. Call-ups. Yes, the notion of the best stars graduating to Raw or SmackDown meant that things stayed fresh in NXT. But the fact that the brand was seen as a few rungs below the main roster meant that Vince McMahon, Bruce Pritchard, Kevin Dunn, and any other wacky member of McMahon's cabal didn't have to pay lip service to fans, nor did they need to respect continuity. I mean, it's WWE. They haven't given a toss for years. Over 100 acts have been called up from NXT, all with vastly different levels of success. And Seeing as this is Cultaholic and I am Adam Pachisi, well, <laughs> of course we're going to rank them. That's how this works. But first, let's draw a line in the sand. We are only looking at NXT from 2012 onwards, you know, when it was an actual wrestling show and not Percy Watson running around carrying barrels. So there will be no Daniel Bryan, no Wade Barrett, no AJ Lee, and unfortunately, no Michael McGillicutty. Likewise, we are only looking at true NXT call-ups, so no one-off matches or cross-promotional appearances that were there for storyline reasons. The Undisputed Era at Survivor Series 2019, for example, or pretty much everyone from the Cruiserweight Classic before 205 Live started. In terms of who got called up, we are looking at performers who featured on NXT TV, so therefore no Omos, and shockingly, no Dean Ambrose. And only in-ring performers too, because otherwise we would be here for far longer than we already need to be. And finally, we are not including established WWE stars who went to NXT because they had nothing better to do before coming back to the main roster, and then having nothing better to do. Without further ado, I am Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WWE NXT call-up ranked from worst to best. Join us! Number 105, Mercedes Martinez. Mercedes Martinez was only in NXT for a couple of months before WWE top bra said yes please and called her up for a huge foundation shaking role as part of retribution. All right, stop giggling, it's not funny. Martinez and her wild naughty mates tipped over a few plants, swore loudly and hung around looking menacing. She was given the name Retaliation, that's not a name, and a gimp mask. Luckily, Martinez had the foresight to know that the angle was a bust and said, this is bollocks, put me back in NXT, please. WWE granted Martinez her request and less than a year later, granted her release too. Number 104, Chelsea Green. We often talk of the NXT curse and arguably no one suffered from it more than Chelsea Green. After a decent run in NXT, returning from a broken wrist, Green made her Raw debut in December 2019, lost to Charlotte Flair, then went straight back to NXT. May 2020, Green was scheduled to debut on Raw proper, but Paul Heyman left the brand and the debut was scrapped. November 2020, Green finally appeared on SmackDown and was scheduled to win a fatal four-way to get onto the Survivor Series team, but broke her wrist again and was released the following April. Talk about a hot mess. Number 103, Lars Sullivan. Looking like a cross between Shrek and George the Animal Steel, Lars Sullivan stuck out like a sore thumb in NXT, but you just knew that Vince McMahon would love him on main. After a year as a regular member of the NXT roster, Sullivan Vignette said in late 2018 that his debut was delayed due to ongoing anxiety issues and the emergence of controversial posts made prior to his WWE career. When Sullivan finally did debut, he did so in style by battering Kurt Angle before swallowing Lucha House Party whole. A knee injury put Lars out for a few months. He then returned, smashed Jeff Hardy and others, then disappeared 
disappeared before quitting the business in early 2021. Number 102, Hit Row. Expectations were high when Hit Row were called up as the group of Isaiah Swerve Scott, B-Fab, Ashante the Adonis, and Top Dollar seemed like a bankable group. Then the wheels fell off. First, B-Fab was unceremoniously let go. Then Top Dollar got a little too big for his boots and rubbed everyone up the wrong way, never mind a poorly timed racially insensitive diss track on Jinder Mahal. And then just two weeks after B-Fab's release, the rest of the crew were dropped as Vince allegedly only saw Dollar as a star. Presumably, seeing as he had been released, Vince thought, sod it, and cut his losses. This is, of course, despite the fact that Swerve Scott is absolutely fantastic. Moving on. Number 101, Rinku. With the Bollywood boys gone from Jinder Mahal's side, WWE called up Indus Shares Rinku to join the modern-day Maharaja, where his name was changed to Veer, because why not? Big and imposing, and with some cool-looking face paints, Veer has frankly done little of note since his move to the main roster, with himself and Shanky usually on the receiving end of a Drew McIntyre beatdown or narrowly avoiding decapitation with a big sword. To be fair, though, Veer does have a dark match against John Cena to his name, which he lost, obviously. Don't worry, though, kids. Veer is a solo star now, and he's coming to Raw! any minute now. Number 100, Adam Rose. Leo Kruger was a hot prospect, a two-time FCW champion. It was thought that his future was assured as FCW gave way to NXT. He then had a change of heart and became the Russell Brand-inspired Adam Rose, a fella who ambiguously partied with future stars of the business and danced around a bit. The gimmick made its way to the main roster, where Rose got completely overshadowed by a dork in a bunny costume. Rose then changed tack to become a pretentious artiste and was later released by WWE in 2016 following domestic abuse allegations. The bloom by that point was completely off the rose. Number 99, No Way Jose. Undeterred, NXT tweaked the Adam Rose gimmick and gave it to the infinitely more likable No Way Jose. Regardless of the performer, the gimmick would never get past the bottom of the card and after getting pummeled week in week out by sanity, Jose made his way to Raw. Things didn't pan out much better on the flag brand where Jose quickly became fodder for lower card stars like my boy Mojo Rawley. He did have a fun spot in the 2019 Royal Rumble where he was murdered by Samoa Joe and Drew McIntyre, but it was sadly little surprise when he was released in April 2020. Number 98, Connor and Victor, The Ascension. Despite having the longest single NXT tag title run ever, The Ascension were treated like utter geeks from the second that they arrived on the main roster in December 2014. After being openly mocked by the announce crew for ripping off LOD, Demolition and the Powers of Pain, Connor and Victor were then beaten up by the APA and New Age Outlaws. Eventually, the duo settled for being the sidekicks of Stardust and then slid even lower down the card to be side characters in Brie Zango's Fashion Files series. The strange thing? It's still not exactly clear why WWE torpedoed the Ascension. They went from force to farce in a matter of weeks. Number 97? Mia Yim. A standout of the first Mae Young classic, Mia Yim had a good run in NXT before a well-deserved call-up in 2020, and straight into retribution. Given the terrible name Reckoning, and with some white dots painted across her face, Yim had four matches across Raw and main events, winning one and losing three. Mercifully, Yim eventually broke free from retribution, but before she could do anything, she was released by WWE. What a waste. Number 19. Tegan Knox. You have to feel for Tegan Knox. After coming back from several major injuries, she was called up to SmackDown, where she and tag partner Shotzi Blackheart had their name shortened, but managed to win a ton of Champions Contenders matches, whatever the hell they are. The team never actually got a shot at the women's tag titles and were instead split up in the draft before one name Knox was released. You have to imagine that she is going to do great literally anywhere else. Number 95, Karrion Cross. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yep, certainly one of the worst call-ups of all time, isn't it? Now, Cross in NXT was a divisive character after his undefeated steamrolling of the roster didn't really fit in with the NXT ethos. But still, he had a great look and a fantastic entrance. He was heavily pushed and heavily protected. You assumed that Vince McMahon would love him. You assumed wrong. First of all, he debuted on Raw while still the undefeated NXT champion, but was stripped of Scarlet and his cool intro and promptly lost to Jeff.
Jeff Hardy. Then, after Cross dropped the NXT title, he stuck around on Raw and was given that hideous mask and strap combination. Then, whilst he was in the midst of a second reboot, WWE binned him and Scarlett. An absolute laughing stock, unfortunately. Number 94, Riddick Moss. Riddick Moss seemed stuck in NXT. Signed to a developmental deal in 2014, Moss just kind of bumbled about, teaming with Tino Sabatelli for a bit until tearing his Achilles tendon in 2018. After his return, it wasn't long before his call-up as Mojo Rawley's personal offensive lineman. I have no idea what that means. He quickly betrayed Mojo to win the prestigious 24-7 title, holding Big Greeny for 40 days before losing it to our truth on WWE's social media channels. Ugh. Moss then ended up on Raw Underground, punched a few fellas, quietly disappeared, and has since reappeared a year later as Corbin's latest hired goon, Mad Cat Moss. Number 93, Leo Rush. After ruffling feathers in NXT, Leo Rush had a good run on 205 Live before going to Raw to follow Bobby Lashley around and, again, ruffle feathers. Rush acted as IC champion Lashley's personal hype man, which consisted of little more than shouting and pointing at Big Bad Bob's beautiful buff bum. Good to be fair. Leo did help Lashley kick Finn Balor about the place until Finn pinned him during a handicap match, leading to Lashley losing the belt. Rush then reportedly got himself a boatload of heat backstage, took a sabbatical, then returned to NXT for a few months before being released. Number 92, EC3. Despite a quick but great run as Derek Chicks and America Bateman in the original NXT, it was when he jumped to TNA and became Ethan Carter III that EC3's career truly took off. A multi-time Impact World Champion, when he came back to NXT, we all assumed that he would be pushed to the moon on the main roster. His NXT run was okay, but once he was called up, he was pushed right off the bat with a win over Dean Ambrose. However, it didn't help his standing in the eyes of the fans, mainly because Ambrose was very, very popular and on his way out the company. Vince McMahon was so enraged at this reaction that he turned Carter, who had also been plagued by concussion issues, into a jobber. Not a smart move. Number 91, Eric Young. A former TNA world champion and one of the top heels of NXT during his run as the figurehead of Sanity, it was a crime the way WWE used Eric Young on the main roster. Instead of continuing their anarchic reign of terror across Raw or SmackDown, Sanity were instead pushed way down to the bottom of the card, with Young eventually cut loose from the group so that he could sink even further. Young is very good in the ring and a damn fine talker with a hell of a wrestling head on his shoulders, so how nobody could think of anything for him besides Jobber is madness. Number 90, Xia Li. Xia Li in NXT was weird, wasn't she? Possessed by a mysterious figure as everything played out like a bad Mortal Kombat cutscene, it was both rubbish and absolutely brilliant at the same time. Li being drafted to SmackDown was no surprise, and after weeks of vignettes, she arrived with literal lightning pinging off her like Thor as she vowed to kick bullies' heads in. It's a decent start, and Lee has all the tools to be a star, but for now we will have to wait and see how her run actually pans out. Number 89, Samir and Samil, the Bollywood Boys. During Jinder Mahal's unlikely voyage to the top of WWE, he needed a pair of lackeys to get tossed around whilst he sorted off with his WWE title. Those lackeys were the Singh Brothers, aka the Bollywood Boys, and boy did Samir and Sunil get tossed. In ring, they were little more than fall guys, having the distinction of losing multiple handicap matches against the likes of Shinsuke Nakamura, AJ Styles, and Alistair Black. Eventually, the pair were released, coincidentally not long after Jinder binned them off for Veer and Shanky. Number 88, Shane Thorne. A tag team specialist with Nick Miller as TM61 or the Mighty Don't Kneel, Shane Thorne found himself stuck when Miller departed WWE. Don't worry, whispered Vince McMahon. We'll take care of you, pal. And thus, Slapjack was born and inserted into retribution. That's right, Slapjack. Not a delicious OT treat nor a tribute to Harlem Heat Stevie Ray, but Shane Thorne in a big old hockey mask. Like the rest of Retribution, it was utter tripe. Now, Thorne is a good wrestler, but not even the combined powers of The Rock, Hulk Hogan, and Steve Austin could have made this gimmick work. So, after Retribution was thrown in the bin, the Slapjack name was retired, and Thorne became Crocodile Dundee instead, shortly before being released. Number 87, Ty Dillinger. 
10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. After getting massively over with his perfect 10 gimmick, NXT fans clamoured for Ty Dillinger to defeat longtime rival Bobby Roode for the NXT title. He didn't, but then he popped up in the Royal Rumble before making his full main roster debut in April 2017. It was a long time coming for Dillinger, who had been in WWE developmental on and off for over 10 years. But the dream quickly became a nightmare, and Dillinger soon became a jobber whenever he actually managed to appear on TV, that is. Now part of AEW's pinnacle, Sean Spears still doesn't win much, to be honest, but he seems far happier. Number 86, Wesley Blake and Steve Cutler. Long considered afterthoughts in NXT, Steve Cutler and former tag champion Wesley Blake banded together with Jackson Riker as the aptly named Forgotten Sons, and they were... Fine, nothing special, just kind of there. The trio ended up on SmackDown in 2020, then Riker sent a pro Donald Trump tweet, alienated much of the locker room, and the team was scrapped, with Blake and Cutler collateral damage. Eventually, the duo returned at King Corbin's side as the Knights of the Lone Wolf, where they did nothing and were released while Riker kept his job and received a push. And people say there's no justice in this cruel, cruel world. Those people are right. Number 85, Alexander Wolfe and Killian Dane. Stuck in the same sinking ship as Eric Young, Sanity's heavy hitters Alexander Wolfe and Killian Dane also deserved far better on WWE's main roster. Unlike Young, though, there was to be redemption back in the warm bosom of NXT. Dane returned to Florida, where he and Drake Maverick were the modern day Master Blaster, while Wolfe went to NXT UK, where he joined Ring Camp, sorry, Imperium, and helped Walter batter everyone in the country. Imperium tried to bring Dane into the fold, but before anything could pan out, both were released by WWE in the summer of 2021. Number 84, Rich Holland. After being not so subtly positioned as the focal point of Pete Dunne's little crew on NXT, Rich Holland was plucked from the developmental brand and turned into Sheamus' number one fan on SmackDown instead. Now, to be fair, we all had a chuckle as he stood there wearing just a flat cap, exclaiming how the lads in the pub loved Sheamus beating John Cena for the WWE. WWE title, but WWE clearly have lofty plans for Holland, and him and Sheamus kicking seven shades of Sheffield out of people is quite fun. Number 83, Hideo Itami. Kenta signing with WWE was massive. One of the top stars of Pro Wrestling Noah during their glory years, his signing and rebirth as Hideo Itami was seen as a game changer. Then, things fell off a cliff. After a promising start, including an appearance at WrestleMania 31, Itami was put on the shelf with a shoulder injury and his NXT career was completely derailed. More injury setbacks followed, after which Itami made his way to 205 Live. A year later, he finally said, well, this is bollocks mate, or the Japanese equivalent, and was granted his release. Now in New Japan Pro Wrestling, Kenta can be found kicking heads in as part of the Bullet Club. Number 82, Jackson Riker. When the Forgotten Sons were called up to the main roster following a so-so NXT run, it wasn't long until they disappeared due to Jackson Riker's controversial political tweets. Surprisingly, as Blake and Cutler bore the brunt of Riker's ill-received comments, Riker himself was given something of a push, teaming with Elias before seemingly turning face. The crowd, of course, didn't buy Riker as a good guy, and his whole run went over as well as a fart in a spacesuit. After doing little of note following the Elias feud, Riker was released in 2021. Number 81, Summer Rae. When WWE doesn't know what to do with someone, they just slap a button that says DANCING GIMMICK and let the performer figure out the rest. Case in point, Summer Rae. Originally Fandango's valet until he ditched her on Twitter, Summer Rae's most memorable role was as Rusev's new manager. That was the storyline when Lana discovered denim and was sheepishly kissed by Dolph Ziggler, who was secretly hoping that Rusev didn't absolutely kill him, remember? Other highlights included managing Tyler Breeze and starring in Oscar winner The Marine for moving targets, and that was about it. Number 80, Emma. Part of the first NXT wave, as FCW disappeared into the rear view, Emma awkwardly danced a lot and became mates with other awkward dorks, like Bailey. Emma soon started appearing in the crowd at Raw and SmackDown and was aligned with Santino Morella, where she awkwardly danced some more, drawing the ire of Summer Rae. A year later, Emma was back in NXT with a newfound edge and renewed focus, and would have a great match with Asuka at Takeover London. She then returned to the supposed big time, first in Team BAD 
Dee and Blonde, then as Emelina after a century's worth of vignettes. The Emelina gimmick was ditched because even WWE knew it sucked, and a few months later, Emma was out the door. Number 79, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa's blood feud was one of the most celebrated rivalries in decades. It seemed like the former NXT tag team champions were on the verge of killing one another through a series of grueling fights, and in the midst of it, Vince McMahon and his stooges said, nah, who cares? Put them back together and bring them up to SmackDown. So DIY were back together, even though it made no sense at all. They defeated the Revival and the Bar before Champa injured his neck and needed surgery, ruining their storyline on NXT. Fans were very angry about this, and I can only assume Triple H ate his desk in frustration. Number 78, Tony Storm. A stellar NXT UK run, which included a women's title reign and a top run in NXT's main event as a vicious heel, set Tony Storm up for the WWE main roster. And they did next to nothing with her. Well, they did turn her face and gave her a few wins, but that aside, Storm did little of note as WWE threatened to slip back to the dark days of the pre-women's revolution. Storm did get tangled with the SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair, but ended up with literal pie on her face and then walked out of WWE. Hard to blame her, really. Number 77, Aaliyah. After telling Robert Stone to kick rocks, Aaliyah was called up despite her run with the Robert Stone brand being a bit pants. With no matches on TV to her credit, Aaliyah's name was plucked out of a big hat to join the SmackDown Women's Survivor Series team, seemingly at random. You know, that thing that was announced on Twitter instead of being used for any storylines? That one. But after a spirited TV debut that saw her team with Naomi and Sasha Banks to defeat Natalia, Shayna Baszler, and Shotzi, that mean old Sonya Deville booted Aaliyah off the Survivor Series team, with Aaliyah forming an alliance with another victim of authority, Naomi, instead. She's not done much since. Number 76, Sarah Logan. Sarah Logan's time in NXT was rather uneventful, with only a handful of televised appearances before she was called up to the big time. Part of the Riot Squad with Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan, Logan's time on main roster was also rather uneventful, despite a strong start with multiple tag wins alongside Liv. WWE threw Sarah the odd bone with singles bouts against the likes of Charlotte Flair and a high-profile outing against the Bellas and Ronda Rousey at Super Showdown, but they never took advantage of her potential, releasing Logan from her contract in 2020. Number 75, Dominic Dijakovic and Dio Madden. Dominic Dijakovic was a promising talent in NXT's upper echelon. Dio Madden had displayed flair when on Raw's announced team. One day, they were having a delightful picnic on the PC floor when they were whisked away by a tornado called Vince McMahon and dropped into a pile of dung called Retribution. Of all of WWE's piss-poor booking, the fact that this was the best they could do with Big Dom was infuriating to say the least. But hey-ho, they've ditched the group and the masks, except now they have face paint and have kept the names, T-Bar and Mace. At least Mace is good on Twitter, I guess? Straws. I'll grasp at them. Number 74, Dana Brooke. Now, no disrespect to Dana, but without cheating, what is the most memorable thing that she's done in her six years on Maine? Okay, she was decent in that weird Money in the Bank match, and her promo with Ronda Rousey was quite good, even if she did get squashed in seconds as a result. Quite simply, Dana was called up too soon from NXT, and in the years since, Dana's character has barely evolved despite her improvement in the ring. WWE have given Dana roles along alongside Titus Worldwide, which didn't amount to much, and a tag team with Mandy Rose, which was ended before it got going, but nothing has ever stuck. Aside from the 24-7 shenanigans, and that's hardly something to write home about. Number 73, Simon Gotch. Purveyors of manly manliness, the Vaude villains were very over in NXT, where they reigned as tag team champions on one occasion. However, it was clear that the gimmick would never work on the WWE main roster, and it didn't, with Apathy greeting Simon Simon Gotch and Aiden English during their brief run together in the big leagues. Despite a decent start to main roster life, things unraveled when Enzo Amore necked himself on the bottom rope and Gotch and English were relegated to jobber status as a result. Apparently, Gotch wasn't well liked backstage, allegedly taking an unopened soda can to the face after angering Sin Cara, and one year after debuting on the main roster, Simon Gotch was Simon Gone. Number 72, Austin Aries. The greatest man who ever lived, his words, definitely not mine, Austin
Austin Aries was a former Ring of Honor and Impact World Champion when he joined NXT during its frankly ridiculous run of signing every indie darling ever. There was a lot of expectation, but frankly, Aries failed to live up to the hype, in part due to several injuries. When cleared, A-Double was sent to 205 Live because, let's face it, he's not the tallest man that ever lived. His work in the division was very good, including a sleeper hit against Neville at WrestleMania 33, but soon Aries was out the door for a whole host of reasons. Number 71, Tucker Knight. Teaming with meat-obsessed maniac Otis was never going to pan out well for Tucker. His status as the Marty Jannetty of heavy machinery was a surprise to no one. Still, the duo were well-liked and well-positioned on WWE TV, but all the shine rubbed off onto Otis. Tucky would eventually turn on Big Oat, win the 24-7 championship, and lose it just as quickly. He then completely disappeared from television. But luckily, all was not lost, as Tucker made his way back to TV for the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, but it wasn't at WrestleMania, and less than a week later, Tucky was sad released. Number 70, Shotzi Blackheart. Shotzi Blackheart was flying high in NXT, teaming with Ember Moon, so Vince plucked her from obscurity because she had a great look and access to a tank. He told Ember to stay exactly where she was and put Blackheart with Tegan Knox instead. Vince did his usual thing of screaming, everyone must have one name, with Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox becoming the 70s detective sounding Shotzi and Knox. The pair did win a thousand championship contenders matches on SmackDown, but never got a women's tag title shot and was split in the draft. After this, Shotzi turned heel and worryingly may have been made to drop all of the things that made her exciting in the first place. Number 69, Rich Swan. A decent face in a packed crowd, Swan got his big break in WWE when the Cruiserweight Classic gave birth to WWE's mistreated youngest child, 205 Live. It was on 205 Live where Swan got his biggest push in the company, defeating Brian Kendrick for the Cruiserweight title on the inaugural edition of the show in November 2016. Swan would drop the title to Neville after a decent reign, but would soon be out injured, before returning later in 2017, then ultimately leaving WWE in the midst of domestic abuse allegations. After being cleared of all charges, Swan went to Impact Wrestling, where he eventually won the Impact World title. Number 68, Keith Lee. Bask in his glory. After dominating everyone with little reply at Survivor Series 2019, we were ready for Keith Lee to become the biggest star in WWE. Ditto when he went face to face with Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. When the Limitless One finally joined the main roster full time, he did so fresh from a run as the first ever combined NXT and North American champion, strolling into a victory over Randy Orton. Keith's ceiling was indeed limitless. But when Keith was getting some serious momentum, he was taken off of TV and no one really knew what was going on. Five months went by full of rumor and innuendo, baseless speculation, and genuine concern before it was revealed that Keith had contracted COVID-19 and had subsequent heart inflammation issues. Fully cleared to return, Keith became Bearcat Lee, and then, well, I mean, Bearcat Lee. Need I say more? We still can't work out how WWE blew this one. Number 67, Angel Garza. Oh, handsome angel, studly, cheekboned angel, possible second coming of Eddie Guerrero, angel, oh, angel. Angel Garza's time in NXT was short, but featured a run with the Cruiserweight title before he was sent off to Raw to beat up cousin Umberto Carrillo. After leathering Umberto and Rey Mysterio a bit, he teamed with Andrade, fell out with Andrade, and bumbled around like a goof. When he won the 24-7 title on TikTok, Christ I feel old, we all thought, oh bugger, there goes Garza's career. But luckily it seems that the end is not nigh, as Garza and Umberto have put their differences aside to team up as Los Lotharios. WWE did strip them of their surnames though, because that's just a thing that happens these days. Number 66, Tyler Breeze. With hindsight, it's weird seeing just how valued and well-pushed Tyler Breeze was in his NXT days, having the honor of facing Jushin Thunder Liger in his only WWE bout of all things. But by the time he was rolled onto the main roster, Breeze was DOA, with the powers that be deciding that he should be a comedy airhead geek and seldom letting Prince Pretty flex his character or in-ring chops. Breeze did give it his all when he had the chance, and his fashion police work with Fandango was a hell of a lot of fun, and perhaps the only reason 
reason he's ranking so high here, but I guess it was a bit meaningless in the grand scheme. Luckily, Breeze went back to NXT in 2019 and was treated far better until his release in 2021. Number 65, Umberto Carrillo. One phrase to sum up Umberto Carrillo's main roster adventure is stop start. After his call up in October 2019, he fought AJ Styles and teamed with Kane Velasquez before getting routinely thumped by Andrade and Angel Garza heading into the pandemic era. After a spell stuck on main event, Umberto returned to Raw, where this time round, Seth Rollins and Murphy were the tormentors of choice. Another main event stint came and went, and Sheamus used him as a punching bag for a while before finally Umberto and Angel Garza settled their differences, teamed up, and turned heel. Number 64, Eric Bugenhagen. After impressing Vince McMahon due to his work advertising Old Spice and winning the 24-7 title, what an odd sentence to say out loud, the decision was made to call Rick Boogs up, pairing him with Shinsuke Nakamura as his own personal guitarist. At Nakamura's side, Boogs has been well promoted on TV, getting wins over the likes of Dolph Ziggler, Robert Roode, and Sami Zayn, amongst others. Like others on this list, it's still early days, but things at least look promising. Number 63, Selena Vega. Primarily Andrade Cien Almas's mouthpiece and occasional Hurricane Rana thrower on NXT, when the tandem made their way to main roster, WWE management screamed, No managers, you must wrestle too! And Vega whipped on her boots. Still, Vega was first and foremost a manager, looking after the likes of Andrade, Angel Garza, and Austin Theory. Vega also loved a bit of Twitch and OnlyFans, don't we all? And after tangling with WWE officials over her accounts, was very publicly released. But hey ho, no bridges were burned, and half a year later, Vega was back, losing practically every match she was a part of before somehow becoming the first ever WWE Queen's Crown winner. Number 62, Colin Cassidy. Did you know that you can't teach being seven foot tall? Well, Colin Cassidy knew that, and the King of Queens used his size to his advantage as he and Enzo Amore's Little and Large Act got over massively with the NXT audience. That popularity followed the pair to Raw, with Enzo and Cass having one of the greatest main roster debuts in recent memory. When Enzo was out injured, Big Cass was momentarily given the rocket treatment before the pair settled into the tag title scene. Obviously, they were split up, and despite WWE's efforts, Cass floundered. Feuds with Enzo and Daniel Bryan did little for Cass, and whilst battling mental health and alcohol abuse issues, Cass and WWE parted ways. Thankfully, he seems to be doing a lot better now and is finding success as W. Morrissey in Impact Wrestling. Number 61, Ember Moon. Ember Moon's battles with Asuka in NXT were star-making performances, and when she finally lifted the title, we knew it wouldn't be long until she would be challenging for main roster honors. Unfortunately, though, things didn't go quite to plan. There were bright spots, like participation in the Money in the Bank ladder match and a SmackDown women's title bout with Bayley at SummerSlam 2019, but then there were the injuries and a losing streak. Eventually, Ember would go back to NXT, win and lose the NXT women's tag titles, then would be sidelined for a while before WWE released her from her contract. WWE's loss is surely going to be another company's gain. Number 60, Ruby Riot. Despite a strong main roster debut, that involved the Riot Squad leathering Naomi and Becky Lynch for no reason, Ruby Riot's main roster career can be summed up with a weak shrug. A talented performer with a great look, Riot was never given any form of meaningful push. She did have high profile outings, but was usually left looking at the lights, like when Ronda Rousey annihilated her in under two minutes at Elimination Chamber 2019. After splitting up and reforming, the Riot Squad did force the Iconics to disband, but then Ruby was released in June 2019. 2021. Now part of AEW, Ruby is finally getting the platform that she deserves. Number 59, Liv Morgan. Like Riot Squad partners Ruby Riot and Sarah Logan before her, Liv Morgan has rarely been treated as a big deal by WWE, but she's perhaps had the best time of all three. Indeed, the fact that she's still in the Fed whilst Ruby and Logan were let go speaks volumes, and her rivalry with Raw Women's Champion Becky Lynch was definitely a step in the right direction. But let's just hope this is not a flash in the pan and that WWE does something actually meaningful with Liv soon before she wanders off to hang out with her pigs and Bo Dallas full time. Number 58, Bo Dallas. Speaking of Bo Dallas, one of the greatest NXT champions ever, there was a weight of expectation on Bo Dallas when he arrived on the 
main roster. Adopting a deluded motivational speaker gimmick, Bo told us all to Bo leave. I just hope that he didn't Bo leave that he was going to climb up the card. Well, hey. He sank so far that he was dubbed a social outcast, and things only spiraled until The Miz hired both Bo and Curtis Axel as his miz -tourage. Harmless fun, yes, but Dallas was capable of so much more. After leaving The Miz, the B-team somehow picked up tag gold by beating Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt, retained against The Revival, then slipped even further down the pecking order and into the 24-7 title scene before being released. Number 57, Mojo Rawley. Get, get, get hyped, playboy! Here we go! Running around like a toddler after a double espresso and a Pro Plus, Mojo Rawley was perma-hyped and found his groove with hype bro Zack Ryder in NXT's tag division after a few years spinning his wheels. When Mojo made his way up to the main roster, the hype bros languished at the bottom of the card until someone told management that Mojo knew NFL star Rob Gronkowski. Suddenly, my boy was treated like the star that he deserved to be. Mojo won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal with a little help from Gronk, then after shouting at himself in a mirror for some reason, dropped back down to the 24-7 title division where he put over Gronk and soon disappeared off WWE TV. Eventually WWE let Mojo go and I was there waiting for him with two tickets to Club Tropicana and a suitcase full of Zubaz. Number 56, Sonya Deville. Long before lording over Smackdown in her shiny tie, Sonya Deville spent a few years on the main roster, but truth be told they were pretty forgetful from an in-ring perspective. First, Sonya was part of Absolution, with Paige and Mandy Rose often losing, but Sonya and Mandy found greater success when teaming up as Fire and Desire. Okay, so they still lost a lot, but at least they were featured on TV, especially when Mandy became the object of Otis's sweaty desires. After failing to scupper Otis's chances with Mandy, Sonya split from her teammate and left for over a year. She later returned as assistant to the regional manager, Adam Pearce, on SmackDown. Although we've had a enough authority figures to last a lifetime, DeVille has actually excelled in the role, and her needing of Naomi has added some much-needed narrative to the women's mid-card, even if it doesn't quite make sense. Number 55, Aiden English. Despite his success in NXT with the Vaude villains being erased when the pair were called up, Aiden English successfully reinvented himself and got over like Rover due to his position as Rusev's right-hand man. Around this time, all I had to say was, what day is today? And the cries of Rusev! Rusev Day will shatter all windows in a 10 mile radius. Obviously, WWE weren't happy, as you're not allowed to get over on your own, damn it, and soon Rusev and Aiden were split up and forced to fight each other for our sports entertainment. English soon transitioned to commentary, which he was pretty bloody great at, but was let go in April 2020. Number 54, Alistair Black. So, you've got one of the most exciting pro wrestlers on the planet, with an incredible wrestling mind and a legion of fans due to a sublime NXT. T run, and the best you do is stick him in a cupboard begging for a fight? WWE, you old dog, you've done it again. Seriously, the fact that Black floundered so badly on the main roster was ridiculous. From the creaky sound effects ruining his cool entrance, through the months of begging for fights, it reads as a laundry list of what not to do with an established character. After suffering at the hands of Murphy and having his eye caved in, Black's rebirth as the Dark Father looked like we were finally getting the main roster push we were all waiting for. But no, instead, he was released, sauntered over to AEW, and is now thankfully treated as a star and a terrifying threat. Number 53, Kyrie Sane. A former NXT Women's Champion, when Pirate Princess Kyrie Sane was called up and teamed with Asuka, we all thought, okay, this could be interesting. The two were the standouts in a division that they were quite frankly too good for, defeating Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross for the women's tag titles before embarking on a reign that saw Sane and Asuka defend across the main roster and NXT with victories over the likes of Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch, Bayley and Sasha Banks, and many others. Eventually, the Kabuki Warriors would dropped the straps back to Alexa and Nikki at WrestleMania 36, and a few months later, Sane was off WWE TV. Number 52, The Authors of Pain Imagine you're one of the most dominant teams in NXT history, with the legendary Paul Ellering pulling the strings. Surely the smartest decision when stepping up to the main roster is ditching him for Drake Maverick, right? Right? 
Well, Authors of Pain did this, and despite a run with the tag team titles, their time on Raw was lackluster, to put it politely. Far from the dominant monsters they were on the black and gold brand, instead, Razor and Acam were just sort of there. And when they lost the Raw tag titles to Rude and Gable due to Piss Happy Maverick taking the pin in a handicap match, we assumed that the only way was down. Eventually, the two would end up as Messiah Seth Rollins hired goons, but after one too many injuries put them on the shelf, time seemed up for AOP. This was confirmed when they were sadly released in 2020. Number 51, Peyton Royce. The Iconics were pretty damn over on the main roster, but WWE fumbled the ball so many times with the pair that it isn't even funny. Yes, the duo did reign as women's tag team champions, and as Peyton Royce and Billy Kay cried in victory at WrestleMania 35, things looked good. But of course, the pair were eventually split, and Royce was positioned for greatness in the women's division until WWE gave up and said, sod it, put her in a tag team with Lacey Evans? Seriously, WWE split up a popular tag team just to put the designated breakout star in another tag team. When Lacey got pregnant, WWE decided they had nothing left for Peyton and shockingly released her and Billy Kay in April 2021 before the redubbed inspiration made their way to Impact Wrestling. Number 50, Billy Kay. You didn't have to be a real journalism to figure out that whatever it is, Billy Kay had bags of it, despite WWE not realizing, um, it. After the iconic split, Kay was given nothing to do, so she grabbed some resumes and made her way around the SmackDown locker room, attempting to find a new crew to join. Eventually, Billy decided that she wanted to be in the Riot Squad, despite Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan being jerks to her, and through her never-say-die attitude and natural comedic timing, Kay once again got over with the fans. Obviously, WWE decided this would not do, and after a quick nonsensical heel turn, she was released in April 2021 alongside Peyton Royce. You gotta be joking me! Number 49, Kalisto. After somehow helping to repair Sin Cara's image as part of the Lucha Dragons in NXT, WWE took one look at Kalisto and decided that he was to be the next Rey Mysterio after the last next Rey Mysterio didn't turn out to be the next Rey Mysterio. It didn't exactly work, but Kalisto still made the most of his main roster run, first continuing on with Lucha Dragons, then defying all expectation by reigning as US Champion on two separate occasions, beating the likes of Alberto Del Rio and Ryback before ultimately surrendering to the mighty Rusev. Kalisto stayed in a decent spot, tangling with IC champion Miz and defeating Braun Strowman in a dumpster match. Unfortunately though, Braun put Kalisto in said dumpster and yeeted him into WWE's No Man's Land, the Cruiserweight division. After a quick Cruiserweight title run, he formed Lucha House Party, but the team were never properly pushed, and after eight years with the company, Kalisto was released in April 2020. 21. Number 48, Enzo Amore. Enzo and Cass instantly became one of the most popular acts in WWE, with Amore's gift of gab and gift of jab making him the modern day road dog. Sort of. Like all tag teams in WWE, Enzo and Cass were split once they reached the main roster, mainly because Cass is seven foot tall and Enzo is not. However, the feud between the two was disappointing, and despite Enzo's best efforts on the mic, his act needed refreshing. When he turned heel and became the figurehead of the cruiserweight division, it was genuinely good work, with WWE somehow becoming self-aware and pushing Enzo as the average wrestler in a division of workhorses clinging on to the cruiserweight title by any means. However, during his second run as champ in 2018, accusations of misconduct were leveled at Enzo and he was fired on the spot. Number 47, Adrian Neville. After ushering in NXT's golden period with his championship run, big strong Geordie boy Neville was surely destined for great things in WWE. That is, until Vince McMahon saw him and thought, Mighty Mouse, because in Vince's mind, it's still the 1950s. Luckily, the gimmick never came to fruition, and the man that gravity forgot became immensely popular with WWE crowds. Sadly, though, he was never given anything particularly meaty to sink his teeth into. Certainly not as meaty as those pecs of his, am I right? Whoa. 
Eventually, Big Nev ended up in the cruiserweight division, won the title, and ran through everyone in his wake. Though Neville's work as the king of the cruiserweights was fantastic, it was firmly beneath 205 Live's impenetrable glass ceiling. Understandably, Neville got sick of loitering near the bottom of the card, and after a myriad of disagreements with WWE, he sat on the sidelines for months on end. Eventually, he was granted his release and was next seen hanging around the Newcastle Quayside in his All Elite Undies. Number 46, Jason Jordan. With American Alpha seen as the next team angle, WWE took this notion to heart and decided that Jason Jordan was Kurt Angle's illegitimate son. Even though the storyline was sneered at by the majority of WWE fans, it was a hell of an endorsement by WWE, and The Rocket was well and truly prepped for Jordan. After a SmackDown tag title run with American Alpha, Jordan would team up with Seth Rollins, where the two would hold Raw Tag Gold, Jordan becoming the first man to hold all three brands' tag titles. A heel turn was planned, with Jordan scheduled to retire Papa Kurt and possibly suplex the absolute bejesus out of Seth, Roman, and anyone else at the top of the card. Unfortunately, just as this run was about to take off, Jordan suffered a career-ending neck injury and now works as a backstage producer in WWE. Number 45, Austin Theory. With stars left, right, and center absent from TV in 2020, WWE needed some quick fixes, especially with WrestleMania 36 right around the corner. The call was made to pull recent signee Austin Theory from NXT to main roster because, damn it, why not? Associating on screen with Zelina Vega and Angel Garza, Theory wound up in the tag title hunt, unsuccessfully challenging for the Street Profits gold at a very different sort of WrestleMania. His alliance with Seth Rollins suggested that the sky was the limit, but with no fanfare, Austin was sent back to NXT, where he perfected his comedy chops as part of the way. Theory then reappeared on Raw to take selfies with fallen foes before Vince McMahon took him under his meaty, meaty wing, and he's been doing pretty well ever since. Number 44, Lacey Evans. Lacey Evans ticks all the boxes in what WWE traditionally wants in a women's division wrestler, and they could not wait to call her up, debuting her in the 2019 Royal Rumble after only 20 televised NXT matches across two years. Things were shaky at first, but WWE weren't giving up on the sassy Southern Belle, with Evans having the distinction of being one of the first women to wrestle in Saudi Arabia at Crown Jewel 2019. A feud with the greatest women's wrestler who ever lived, Charlotte Flair, seemed to be the beginning of her monster push, with Lacey shacking up with Ric Flair in order to get under Charlotte's skin. But the whole angle had to be nixed when Lacey became pregnant, as was a planned title switch with Asuka at Elimination Chamber 2021. Expect Evans to resume her main event push when she returns. Number 4. 43, The Revival. Settle down, everyone. It's time for another chapter in the never-ending book called Vince McMahon Doesn't Respect Tag Team Wrestling. Despite tearing NXT a new bumhole for the best part of three years, fist enthusiasts The Revival were never really treated as a threat on the main roster, despite reigns with the Raw and SmackDown tag titles. There were good times, though, their feud with The New Day, for example, as well as teaming with Randy Orton as FTRKO. But the good times were few and far between, as major injuries left Dash and Dawson on the shelf for long stretches, leading Vince McMahon to see them as little more than comedy jobbers, even suggesting that the two dress like actual morons. Unsurprisingly, the revival asked for their WWE releases on several occasions, finally leaving for AEW once their contracts expired in the summer of 2020. Number 42, Mandy Rose. Mandy. Called up after a blink and you'll miss it stop in NXT, Mandy Rose was put in a prominent spot during the women's division explosion, teaming with Sonya Deville and Paige as Absolution. Unfortunately, they didn't achieve much as a team, bouncing between Raw and SmackDown looking for something meaningful to do. Then a sweaty, meat-obsessed gentleman awkwardly shuffled his way into her life and changed Mandy's career. The bizarre romance angle with Otis, never mind the creepy shenanigans of Dolph Ziggler and jealousy of Sonya Deville, was absolutely brilliant. With Mandy and Otis becoming huge fan favorites in the process. The WrestleMania blow-off disappointingly occurred in front of zero fans, which must be one of the biggest wrestling disappointments during the lockdown era. Naturally, WWE then split the pair, killing their momentum dead in the water. Mandy subsequently went back to NXT, dyed her hair, and won the women's title. Number 41, Lana. It was a breath of fresh air when Lana and Rusev arrived on the main roster in 2014. Lana even 
even had that rare role in modern WWE, that of a manager. As Rusev's plus one, and unfortunately Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Lashley's plus one as well, Lana became incredibly over with the fans, proving herself and the role of managers indispensable. And then the bell rang and Lana was wrestling an actual match. Credit to Lana, she worked her backside off to improve, but her in-ring skills never really set the world on fire, no matter how many tables she was put through. That's still one of the weirdest ways WWE have tried to get someone over, isn't it? Eventually, though, it looked like it was all about to pay off as Lana and Naomi made a spirited play for the women's tag team titles. WWE had other ideas, booked them to lose, and released Lana shortly after. Number 40, Ricochet. NXT's quest to hoover up every exciting wrestler on the indies was certainly a wild time, and when it was announced that Ricochet was joining the black and gold brand, NXT diehards started mini mosh pits in seven celebration. Right off the bat, Ricochet was treated as a unique talent, with his prowess in the North American title ladder match and feud with Velveteen Dream setting him up to be one of WWE's most exciting stars. Then, much like tag partner Alistair Black, Ricochet's call-up was an underwhelming affair. A victim of stop-start booking, Ricochet did hold the US title for three weeks and since then has always shone when given the spotlight. The problem is, he just hasn't been given the spotlight all that often. There's still time for Ricochet to be the breakout star. We all know he can be, we just need to keep the faith. Right guys? Right? Number 39, Elias Sampson. Ladies and gentlemen, Elias. With massive NXT stars like Bobby Roode and, well, everybody I've already mentioned in this video, all flattering to deceive on main, no one had any hope of the drifter Elias Sampson making waves, but surprisingly he did. Doing little more than grabbing a guitar and taking the piss, Elias got over with the WWE audience and we all walked with him through feuds with Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins and Bobby Lashley, amongst others. But heel and face turns on a whim, no meaningful victories and several injuries meant that the drifter drifted straight into that glass ceiling, and soon found himself floundering in the lower mid-card. With Rick Boogs rocking up in 2021 as WWE's latest cool rock boy, Elias set fire to his guitar, said Elias is dead, and disappeared to his bedroom in a huff. Number 38, Andrade Cien Almas. When Andrade Cien Almas first came to NXT, it frankly wasn't great. Thankfully though, Zelina Vega told him to give his head a wobble and stop partying, and he became one of the best wrestlers on the entire roster, as well as one of the greatest ever NXT champions. Then Almas was called up, and it was underwhelming to say the least. Far from being the main event superstar we all wanted, Andrade spent most of his run as just another face in the mid-card. First, he was stripped of his nickname and surname, Boo. But then he was in the final four of the Royal Rumble. Yay! But then his feud with Rey Mysterio was bundled into the US title scene. Huh? Andrade would eventually beat Rey for the title, but he got pushed down the card soon after, farting around with Garza and Umberto before booking a season ticket to catering. A fuming Andrade asked for his release, eventually getting it before becoming All Elite. Number 37, Hanson row the War Raiders. War Machine is a cool name. War Raiders is slightly less cool, but still cool. Vince McMahon, though, didn't think they were good names, so suggested the Viking Experience. I mean, naming a fearsome tag team after a temporary museum exhibit maybe wasn't the best idea. Everyone said this was awful, so the name was changed to the Viking Raiders, which is admittedly less rubbish, but still not great. A few months into life on the main roster and the Norse Nutjobs tasted championship victory, defeating the Dirty Dogs to become the first team to hold WWE, NXT, Ring of Honor, and IWGP Tag Gold. Then it all went weird as they started bowling and competing with the Street Profits before fighting ninjas and squid aliens in bins. I'm still not sure if this was a collective fever dream or if WWE booking really is this erratic? Wait a second, yes I am. Injury kept the hairy lads on the shelf for over six months, and since returning they've yet to regain any considerable momentum. Number 36, Chad Gable. Chad Gable is a wrestling machine. WWE should have had no problem in booking him as such. Unfortunately, after the demise of American Alpha, they did everything with Gable but book him as a wrestling machine. Let's make him a Bobby Roode fan. That didn't work. Fine then, let's make him Shorty G because he's short. Oh look, that didn't 
wouldn't work either. Who'd have thunk it? Luckily, Chad managed to scrub off the stink of Shorty G to become a big grapple boy once again when he took Smooth Otis under his wing and formed Alpha Academy. In spite of all the obstacles, Gable has met some success on the main roster. He's even a WWE Tag Team Triple Crown winner, holding NXT and SmackDown Tag Gold with American Alpha and Raw Tag Gold with Bobby Roode and most recently Otis. But unless WWE pull their fingers out and makes Gable the badass that we know he is, don't be surprised if he leaves town eventually. Number 35, Apollo Crews. Built like a Shire horse with the grace and agility of a paper aeroplane, the prospect of Apollo Crews in NXT was very exciting because Apollo is quite simply an athletic marvel. But then he was called up far, far too soon. Everyone could see his ability, aside from WWE management, who proceeded to do nothing with Apollo for the best part of five years. Sure, he had a US title run, but he didn't have any character to speak of until he finally turned heel, embraced his Nigerian heritage, and declared himself true royalty on SmackDown. With Commander Aziz by his side, Cruz took hold of the IC title at WrestleMania 37, holding the belt for over four months until King Nakamura took it from him. Bloody royals, eh? Number 34, Buddy Murphy. Murphy seemed like an NXT lifer. Part of the brand for five years, his highlight was a tag title run with Wesley Blake in 2015, after which he did little aside from being absolutely shredded and asking to join 205 Live. Luckily, 205 Live was good for Murphy, and after a decent Cruiserweight title run, he managed to graduate to Raw, building up a nice winning streak before an excellent feud with Alistair Black. Okay, so it may have gone on a little too long, and Murphy registered no singles win, but he looked great, and soon WWE paired him with Seth Rollins. With Rollins, Murphy won the tag titles and helped terrorize the Mysterios and Alistair, amongst others. After turning on Rollins in the name of love, Murphy beat the Messiah, then did nothing until his release in 2021. Undeterred, the rechristened Buddy Matthews challenged Kazuchika Bloody Okada to a big fight, then turned up on AE Bloody W, so it's going alright for him so far. Number 33. Otis Dozovich. Remember what we said earlier about WWE pushing Chad Gable as anything but a wrestling machine and it was awful? Well, somehow taking Greco-Roman wrestler Otis and pushing him as an affable, sweaty meat lover was a genius idea, as the Heavy Machinery star became hugely over. It was Otis's infatuation with Mandy Rose that got the ball rolling, as we were given a sweet story about a graceless weirdo getting the girl, rather than the usual, haha, <laughs> no, approach that WWE usually take. Otis's popularity somehow took him all the way to becoming Mr. Money in the Bank, but his legs were soon cut off and he drifted back down the card. Now smooth, but just as sweaty, Otis's run with Gable has been fun and there's still an outside chance he could one day win the big one and celebrate with a lovely steak dinner. Or ten. Number 32, Shayna Baszler. Shayna Baszler is a frightening human being. The combined longest reigning NXT Women's Champion in history, Baszler was booked as a nigh unbeatable fighting machine that tore its way through the division. And when the Queen of Spades was called up, we all rubbed our hands with glee at the thought of her tearing through the scene once more. It all started well, with Baszler attempting to literally eat people and getting a clean sweep in the Elimination Chamber. Then Becky Lynch beat her with a roll up at WrestleMania 36 and all the wind went out of Baszler's sails. Granted, Baszler did dominate the women's tag scene with Nia Jax, but let's be honest, it was beneath her. Fingers crossed there is still a way back for Shayna and WWE crown her women's champion before it's too late. Number 31, Eric Rowan. Eric Rowan's WWE main roster career was pretty erratic. One moment he would be flying the highest of highs, the next he would be wading through a river of dung, but was never in the middle on firm ground. Let's look at the highs, shall we? That initial run with the Wyatt family was amazing and Rowan was genuinely unsettling as the sheep mask sporting quiet lunatic of the group. His run with Daniel Bryan as a giant conservationist was good too, aside from running over Roman Reigns, as was the successful reunion with Luke Harper as the Bludgeon Brothers. Now the lows. General crowd apathy after his run-ins with the Authority, the fact that his character became, look, the redneck can do a Rubik's Cube. And let's not forget about that spider. Look at the state of that. 
Number 30, Bobby Roode. It's not hard to book Bobby Roode. Have him come out, act like a prick, then DDT people until he lords over everything like a modern day Ric Flair. TNA did this mostly successfully. NXT did this mostly successfully. We all thought Vince McMahon would have no problem. Then Bobby came out all smiling and happy for his main roster debut, and he was reduced to just a catchphrase and a theme song. Despite the Roode we knew and loved being dead and buried, his recent run has still been somewhat successful. The problem is, it hasn't been as successful as it should have been. It's hard to figure out what WWE aren't seeing in Roode, because despite his multiple tag team title runs and his stint as US champion, it's all fell flat. Number 29, Nia Jax. Right, let's get this out of the way. Despite being on the main roster for five years, Nia Jax barely improved in the ring. Some even say she actually regressed, gaining a reputation as an unsafe worker as a result. Now, from a purely kayfabe stance, Nia's run was pretty good, if not a little inconsistent. But everything that happened since she turned Becky Lynch's nose into hamburger meat has made us sort of forget that. Take Nia's triumphant babyface win over Alexa Bliss at WrestleMania 34. It was a great story, and the payoff made Nia an easily likable babyface. But then, after all the incidents, WWE tried to save face by making Nia own her vicious streak, and despite dominating the women's tag division with Shayna Baszler, a lot of fans were not convinced. Still, it did come as a major shock when she was released from her contract in November 2021. Number 28, Damian Priest. It's still not clear just what exactly Damian Priest actually is. Some sort of fighting rock star? A leather-clad sex vampire? A literal archer just without the bow and arrows? Regardless, since the second he left NXT, the former punishment Martinez has been treated very well on Raw. From the get-go, he turned up in the Royal Rumble, got a few eliminations, and the next night was paired up with Latin hip-hop sensation Bad Bunny. Immediately, he was thrown straight into one of WrestleMania 37's marquee matches. Then he fought in the first ever zombie lumberjack match. That was something else, wasn't it? Unbothered by the undead hordes, Priest marched on towards SummerSlam, where he defeated Sheamus for the US title, which he held until Finn Balor captured the gold on Raw. An impressive first year, which shows that WWE clearly have very high hopes for Priest. Number 27, Samoa Joe. After tearing NXT in half like it was a fresh baguette, Samoa Joe made his way to Raw, where he instantly inadvertently crippled Seth Rollins before battering the likes of Roman Reigns, Sami Zayn, and others, and making a beeline for Universal Champion Brock Lesnar. It's a fairly commonly held opinion that Joe should have actually beaten Lesnar in this feud, as his promo work leading up to their clash established him as a believable, terrifying presence. Injuries meant that Joe's time was difficult on the main roster, but whenever he was healthy, he was well used, such as when he turned Rey Mysterio into Lucha Paste at WrestleMania 35. After several more injuries, a run on commentary, his release and subsequent rehiring, Joe made his way back to NXT, where he defeated Karrion Cross for the NXT title. He then had to relinquish it and disappeared into the night like a violent Samoan ghost before once again getting released. Number 26, Luke Harper. Like partner Eric Rowan, Luke Harper enjoyed superb times at the top of WWE's main roster, but unlike his spider-obsessed mate, didn't have to endure quite as much poor creative during his run. But Harper's tale was one of untapped potential, and despite showing exactly what he could do in matches against the likes of Dolph Ziggler or the multi-man IC title match at WrestleMania 31, WWE management just didn't seem interested in pushing him beyond a certain level. Vince McMahon allegedly wasn't impressed that the New York native Harper couldn't do a southern accent, but fans didn't care. And when Harper wasn't included in the Bray Wyatt vs. Randy Orton title match at WrestleMania 33, it felt like a massive missed opportunity to make a new star. Unfortunately for Harper, injuries derailed his run on Maine. WWE eventually lost faith in him and released him. Who cares, shouted Harper, as he transformed into the menacing Mr. Brody Lee, and went on to have the best run of his career in AEW. I think we can all agree it was the very least he deserved. Number 25, Nikki Cross. When Sanity were called up to the main roster, they left behind their most intriguing member as Nikki Cross remained in NXT while Eric Young and co became a rudderless mess. Nikki was eventually called up, but rather than the fearless lunatic who terrorized NXT, main roster Nikki just looked mildly strange by comparison. Think 
Things remained uneventful until Nikki formed a friendship with Alexa Bliss, and the two became the first ever two-time WWE Women's Tag Team Champions until Alexa went all spooky and weird. Flying solo, Nikki finally got some momentum behind her, turned into a superhero, well, almost, won money in the bank, and defeated Charlotte Flair for the big one. It was a remarkable turnaround to see her become the face of a division. Nikki's Raw Women's title reign didn't last that long, however, and she's since fallen back into the tag scene with Rhea Ripley before turning heel on her new mate. Number 24. The Street Profits Despite it being an era of dominance for the Usos and New Day, WWE aren't really too asked by tag teams, and when Street Profits were called up from NXT, we assumed that they would be forgotten about and split up before long. When the duo first popped up on the main roster, they acted as wisecracking narrators for Raw's action, a bit like the great Gonzo and Rizzo the Rat. But this was a Paul Heyman decision to get the duo's personalities over before they got involved with the action. And it worked, with the Profits embarking on a lengthy run with the Raw Tag Championships before awkwardly swapping them with the New Day SmackDown Tag Championships when the two teams swapped brands. We're still half expecting McMahon to pull the plug so he can have that Montez solo run, or even that Dawkins solo run, he is bigger after all, but for now, we will enjoy the Street Profits as they are. Number 23, Matt Riddle A promising part of NXT's upper midcard, Matt Riddle was brought to SmackDown with a bit of a reputation for rubbing people up the wrong way, bro. He made a strong start tussling with AJ Styles before inexplicably losing his first name and moving into the US title scene. There, he defeated Bobby Lashley for a quick run before dropping it to Sheamus at WrestleMania 37. Riddle continued to get over as a scooter-riding airhead, and his partnership with Randy Orton as RK Bro has made him one of the most popular stars in the company. We all waited for Orton to inevitably betray Riddle and propel the original Bro to the top of the singles scene, but so far, so good, with the two reigning as Raw Tag Team Champions from August 2021 to January 2022. Number 22, Carmella. The Princess of Staten Island was kept separate from Enzo and Cass when they were called up, and like in the case of Nikki Cross and Sanity, it was a blessing in disguise. Truth be told, though, I think few of us expected Mella to be just as money as she has been. After a nondescript start, Carmella hitched her wagon to creepy, creepy James Ellsworth, in turn becoming the first winner of the women's money in the bank, despite Ellsworth ruining everything the first time round. Mella eventually cashed in on Charlotte Flair and held the SmackDown Women's Champion for over 130 days, defeating Asuka and Charlotte Flair before Flair regained the title at SummerSlam. Since then, Carmella has always been a credible name to drop into the title picture when needed, or if nothing is going on, she can always dance with our truth, I guess. Number 21, Rhea Ripley. After an impressive showing in the 2021 Royal Rumble, we were all waiting for Rhea Ripley's call-up, which would hopefully reverse the travesty of WrestleMania 36. You know, the one where Rhea Ripley definitely should have beaten Charlotte Flair. Luckily, when Rhea brought her brutality to Raw, she went straight after women's champion Asuka and defeated the Empress at WrestleMania 37 to bring home the gold. Then, Charlotte Flair happened. Again. Despite all this, though, Ripley has gotten over with the WWE audience, and despite her women's tag title run with Nikki almost a superhero being an underwhelming comedown, I don't think any of us are too worried for Ripley's future in the company. Who knows? WWE could be building Rhea as the modern day Sting, and when she finally emphatically defeats Rick, oh, sorry, Charlotte Flair, hopefully she can launch into the stratosphere. Number 20, Alexander Rusev. Big shoeless bruiser Alexander Rusev made one hell of a splash when he made his way to the main roster, tearing his way through the entirety of the WWE en route to the US title and handily taking the strap from Sheamus. With Lana by his side and after losing his first name, Rusev was a glorious throwback to 80s WWF, a foreign menace with muscle who was very, very easy to jeer. Rusev's initial push was monstrous, leading to a huge match with John Cena at WrestleMania 31, which big match John, big match won. Results were mixed for Rusev from then on in. He endured terrible storyline after terrible storyline, but remained in a strongish position because, let's face the facts, even though the League of Nations was a bust, they were still a prominent heel faction. Eventually, Rusev became ridiculously popular thanks to Rusev Day, as he and Aiden English celebrated the greatest day of the year to massive ovations wherever they went. But of course, WWE didn't strike while the iron was hot, and Rusev's 
slid down the card before losing his wife in storyline. Since then, he's been released, relocated to AEW, and evolved into the utterly terrifying Redeemer Miro. Number 19. Sami Zayn Almost nobody from NXT has had a bigger endorsement on their main roster debut than Sami Zayn. Introduced in Montreal by Bret the Bloody Hitman Hart, Zayn challenged US champion John Cena and was treated like a king. But after this match, he was sidelined with an injury, setting a precedent for his entire main roster run. So blighted by injury and interruptions has Zayn been that he has never been allowed to reach his full potential. Despite this, though, his run has been good. The never-ending war, friendship, war, friendship with Kevin Owens has underpinned everything, with the two kicking the stuffing out of each other whenever given the opportunity. Even when they teamed, they had massive outings, such as taking on a returning Daniel Bryan and greatest wrestler since George Hackenschmidt, Shane McMahon, at WrestleMania 34. As IC champion, Zayn would later defeat Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 36 before taking time off during the COVID pandemic. He then came back as the real IC champion, like a hairy scar punk Shawn Michaels. And since then, his conspiracy theorist run has arguably been the most consistent of his main roster career, netting him WWE title opportunities and run-ins with A-listers. And Logan Paul. Number 18, Baron Corbin. Yes, I can't believe it either, but when you think about it, since day one, Baron Corbin has been prominently featured and somewhat protected since his NXT call-up. He's never going to win any awards for most popular WWE superstar, but let's look at the evidence to suggest that he deserves to be ranked so highly on this list. He won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal when it was still semi-important on his debut. He is a former King of the Ring, Money in the Bank winner, and US Champion. He was Constable of WWE for about 15 years. He has one of the best finishers going. In fact, nobody on the main roster has ever kicked out of the end of days. Oh yeah, and he retired Kurt Bloody Angle at WrestleMania clean as a whip. Despite a certain amount of go-away heat at times during his run, it's amazing how easily WWE remedied this when Corbin became broke, smelly, and sad. But of course, WWE undid all this goodwill by making Corbin happy, completely squandering what they had in their hands and rendering him absolutely bloody unbearable again. But in that weird Baron Corbin kind of way, it still sort of works. Number 17, Shinsuke Nakamura. The biggest signing in NXT history, the King of Strong Style has had an odd run on the main roster, to put it mildly. After a mess start where he tangled with Dolph Ziggler and Baron Corbin, Nakamura went on to defeat the likes of John Cena and Randy Orton whilst chasing WWE Champion Jinder Mahal, but he could never quite beat the modern-day Maharaja. Fine, said Nakamura, who bounced back by winning the 2018 Rumble and challenging WWE Champion AJ Styles at WrestleMania 34 in a match that set the anticipation meter to severe. Again, Nakamura fell short, so he punched the phenomenal one in his phenomenal balls and then later punched Jeff Hardy in his balls to win the US title. And that's when things got weird. Well, weirder. Since then, Nakamura has had a second reign as US champion and was IC champion twice, but defended the belts about once every 58 weeks. Seriously, Nakamura is the mid-card Brock Lesnar, with his second IC title run just having one televised defense in its first 90 days. Again, like others on this list, Nakamura should have been treated better on the main roster, and it was harder to squander him than to push him. But with a Royal Rumble win and a WrestleMania main event under his belt, you cannot deny that his run has been a success, from a certain point of view anyway. Number 16, Finn Balor. When Finn Balor left NXT for Raw, he was given the rocket treatment, being the fifth overall pick in the 2016 draft over the likes of John Cena, Brock Lesnar, and Randy Orton. He shockingly beat Roman Reigns on his Raw debut, then became the inaugural Universal Champion at SummerSlam after defeating Seth Rollins. If there is a stronger first month in WWE history, then by all means sound off in the comments. Unfortunately, things flew off the rails at SummerSlam, with Balor sustaining a shoulder injury from a barricade
Suicide Bomb and having to vacate the title the next night on Raw. Since then, things have been up and down for Finn. He's been permanently over and has scored two IC titles, but he's never again sustained a main event run, occasionally being dropped into the title scene to be pummeled by the likes of Brock Lesnar. Oh, and The Fiend destroyed him at SummerSlam 2019, too. Finn decided to go back to NXT again to have some fun, winning the NXT title for a second time and having a great heel run before coming back up to the main roster where he lost against Roman Reigns in a universal title match because the top rope fell off. Number 15, Paige. Paige here at number 15. Despite her main roster run lasting little over three years, it's helped change the face of women's wrestling in WWE. From winning the Divas title on her first night through ushering in the women's revolution, the first ever NXT Women's Champion was front and center in the division from night one until her shock retirement in 2017. There were certainly missteps along the way from the regrettable promo on the Flair family to scandal away from the ring, but they failed to permanently overshadow what Paige meant to her fans. Just listen to the pop when she returned in 2017, flanked by Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. After her in-ring career ended, Paige was still present, from a run as SmackDown GM to managing the Kabuki Warriors. She was also the subject of the mega-successful feature film, Surf's Up 2, Wave Mania. Now Paige makes a nice living streaming on Twitch, kind of like a less attractive version of me. But unlike me, Paige has teased a return to the ring on many occasions, and we all want her to return to her house. Number 14, Xavier Woods. It's odd to remember that Xavier Woods had a main roster life before the New Day, but he did, teaming up with R-Truth for about 10 minutes. Right, now that's out of the way, let's talk all things New Day, shall we? As the driving force of the trio, Woods hasn't always been featured as an in-ring performer for the group, but has been a vital cog in their success, becoming an 11-time tag team champion due to the Freebird rule. With his trombone at hand and vibrant personality, Woods and the New Day went from receiving go-away heat to becoming the most popular act in the business, selling a litany of t-shirts, cereal, unicorn, horns, pancakes, whatever they put their name on, really. Outside of the New Day, Woods has generated a real connection to the WWE audience through his work on the Up Up Down Down gaming channel, amongst several other external exploits. As for Xavier's greatest achievements, forget all those tag titles. How about somehow making everyone care about King of the Ring for the first time in about 20 years, defeating Finn Balor in the 2021 finals? Long may ye reign, King Woods, you man magnificent bastard you. Number 13, Bianca Belair. The EST of WWE had a decent start to life on the main roster, being associated with the Street Profits. But it was when WWE separated Belair from Montez and Dawkins and sent her to SmackDown that she truly seized the opportunity. In a women's division desperate for new stars, Bianca answered the call, lasting over 56 minutes in the 2021 Women's Royal Rumble before sending Rhea Ripley into row Z and making her way to WrestleMania 36. It was at Mania where Belair had one of the moments of 2021, in tears as she and Sasha Banks tore the house down in the historic main event, with even the boss herself grinning from ear to ear as she dropped the SmackDown title to Bianca. One horsewoman down, three to go. Bailey was next, and the EST was the BEST at Backlash and Hell in a Cell. Q Horsewoman 3, Becky Lynch at SummerSlam. Well, everything good has to come to an end, doesn't it? Despite being controversial, Controversially swept aside by the man, Belair gained a measure of redemption coming from 4-1 down at Survivor Series to win, then claiming victory in the Elimination Chamber. And with the women's division in desperate need of a thorough rebuild, don't be surprised to see Belair leading the charge. Number 12, Bray Wyatt. After a blink and you'll miss it run as Husky Harris, Wyndham Rotunda returned to FCW as it became NXT, and the terrifying Bray Wyatt was born. Flanked by the Wyatt family, the the trio made their presence felt on Raw in 2013 and went on a path of destruction with decidedly mixed results. And that would be a constant for Wyatt in WWE. Let's look at the positives and negatives of this first run, shall we? Positives, the feuds with Daniel Bryan, John Cena, and WWE title feud with Randy Orton. Negatives, the mania burial by Cena, and Orton, and Undertaker, and whatever the hell this was. WWE never knew exactly 
exactly what to do with Wyatt, despite the Eater of Worlds having a creative vision and passion like no other. So sod it, they thought, and sent a repackaged Wyatt off to the races as the utterly horrifying fiend. In no time at all, Wyatt went from no hoper to biggest star in the company, winning the Universal title twice and defeating John Cena in the fever dream that was the Firefly Funhouse match. But again, WWE bungled it thanks to Goldberg, Randy Orton, Alexa Bliss, and Lily the Doll. Still, despite all this, Wyatt remained super popular, and his release in 2021 was met with shock and outrage. Number 11, Asuka. The most dominant women's champion in NXT. NXT, the undefeated Asuka made her way to the main roster in 2017 and continued her path of destruction, destroying whoever crossed her before winning the inaugural Women's Royal Rumble. No one was ready for Asuka, not even Raw Women's Champion Charlotte Flair, who, oh, wait, no, 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 Charlotte beat Asuka and ended her undefeated streak at 914 days. Aside from that, the Empress of Tomorrow has sometimes been well utilized by WWE during her run, becoming the second ever Women's Grand Slam winner in 2020, with the Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and Women's Tag titles in her resume, as well as the Rumble win and Money in the Bank. But the unfortunate thing for Asuka is, despite all her accolades and strong booking, she has often been overshadowed by others in her division, usually the for Horsewomen and Ronda Rousey. Regardless, her popularity has never waned, with Asuka grabbing WWE by the scruff of the neck in 2020 and reigning as company MVP throughout the height of the empty arena era. We're not sure where she is now, though. Number 10, Alexa Bliss. More known on NXT for her run as Blake and Murphy's manager than her work as a wrestler, it's safe to say that many of us wrote off Alexa Bliss's chances of domination when she was called up to SmackDown in 2016. But bloody hell, how wrong we were. The first woman to have held the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships, Bliss is a five-time world champion in WWE, as well as two-time tag champion with Nikki Cross and Money in the Bank holder in 2018. Alongside her prominence in the women's division, Bliss has been heavily featured elsewhere on the card too, becoming a key cog in the weird and wonderful world of Bray Wyatt when The Fiend targeted Bliss's on-screen pal Braun Strowman. Then Alexa herself went a bit weird, started talking to a crap doll, and said, everyone on fire, as you do. She's back from a prolonged absence now, and the supernatural hogwash looks to continue. Hooray. Number 9, Big E Langston. Another former NXT champion pegged for big things, it took a while for Big E Langston to reach the pinnacle of WWE. Coming to the main roster as Dolph Ziggler's bodyguard, Big E would have singles gold in under a year with his first IC title run. But it wasn't until he embraced the power of positivity that we realized just what Big Big E was capable of. While his prowess in ring was never short of a spotlight, it was the New Day that brought Big E's personality to the fore, as he gyrated, screamed, ate kazoos, and did basically whatever the hell he wanted, winning a legion of fans and selling a boatload of merchandise in the process. Eight tag team title reigns later, and fans were starting to ask when Big E would follow in Kofi Kingston's footsteps and land the big one, with speculation only mounting when E was separated from Kingston and Woods in the draft. First came another IC title run, then the 2021 Money in the Bank, then Big E finally did it, successfully cashing in on Bobby Lashley to become WWE Champion, having a creditable run with the gold until, as so many do, he ran into Brock Lesnar. Number 8, Kevin Owens. There has been no better call-up debut than that of Kevin Owens when the NXT champion beat the hell out of John Cena and stamped on the US title on Raw before beating him clean at Elimination Chamber. Despite this, like many others on this list, WWE haven't always booked Owens like they should. Stop-start booking, heel and face turns on a whim, these missteps almost overshadow all the positives of Owens' run. But when things are good with KO, they are very, very good. For a start, he headbutted Vince McMahon until he bled, and if that isn't an endorsement, then frankly I don't know what the hell is. There was the backing of Triple H when the game handed Owens the Universal title on a plate, leading to his incredible run with Chris Jericho until Bill Goldberg ruined everything and took the belt because he fancied it. Languishing in feuds with the likes of Shane McMahon harmed KO's momentum, and he soon became rudderless, tossed a US or IC title here and there to keep him relevant. All the fans wanted was to see Owens fight 
And if WWE really listened to their audience, then he would have been a multi-time world champion by now. Despite all the good stuff, it's still a little hard not to be a bit disappointed. Number 7. Drew McIntyre Okay, so this one is cheating a little bit, but I think we can all agree that Drew McIntyre of 2009 is a completely different beast to the Drew McIntyre of today. A bit like when everyone thought the Ultimate Warrior of 1992 was a different bloke. Re-established in part by a strong run in NXT, McIntyre finally looked like he was ready to live up to his chosen one tag and launch into WWE's upper echelon. It took a little while for Drew to get there, as first he had to hang around with Dolph Ziggler in some capacity. Such is the tradition in life after NXT. As 2020 got underway though, the Drew experiment was on. With WWE Champion Brock Lesnar dominating the Royal Rumble for a bit of a laugh, Drew was given the honour of booting him out before winning the Rumble outright, both to a humongous pop. Drew and Brock faced off at WrestleMania 36, with McIntyre slaying the beast for his first WWE Championship, unfortunately in front of zero fans. The rest of 2020 cemented Drew as THE man, with a further WWE title reign to his name before dropping the belt to The Miz. His run since has been up and down, but in terms of being a made man, there is no denying that McIntyre is up there at last. Number 6. Bailey. Like Sasha Banks before her, anticipation was high for Bailey's jump to the main roster, and the hugger hit the ground running when she landed in 2016. She entered straight into a feud with Charlotte and Dana Brooke, eventually beating Charlotte for the Raw Women's title on an episode of Raw. After a successful defense in a four-way at WrestleMania 33, Bailey would drop the belt to Alexa Bliss and soon resume the storyline that has defined her career, her love-hate relationship with Sasha Banks. This was built up again through the first ever Women's Royal Rumble and Elimination Chamber before the pair settled their differences and became the inaugural Women's Tag Team Champions. Bailey would later win the Money in the Bank briefcase and cash in on Charlotte Flair for the SmackDown title, becoming the first women's Grand Slam champion in the process, but cracks started to appear in the hugger's demeanor. After losing her title back to Flair, she snapped, turned heel, stabbed her Bailey buddies to death, regained the belt, and reigned atop SmackDown for the next 380 days. Bailey beat everyone during this reign, but once again it came back round to Sasha Banks. After reigning again as tag champs, Bailey turned on Sasha and eventually dropped the SmackDown women's belt to her at Hell in a Cell 2020. WWE television has missed her presence since suffering a serious injury not long after, but it doesn't seem long until we see her again. Number 5. Sasha Banks Following her triumphant run as NXT Women's Champion, we all hoped that Sasha Banks would be pushed as a true star on main roster, and although it took a while, the boss became one of the most prominent figures in WWE during the women's revolution. After debuting as part of Team Bad, Sasha eventually set her sights on Charlotte, but fell to the Queen on several occasions before finally dethroning her and reigning as Raw Women's Champion. Quite a few times, actually. And that's because WWE decided that what this new belt needed was Charlotte and Sasha hotshotting it to each other for the majority of 2016. Not a great move, to be honest. A few Raw and SmackDown title runs later, as well as being one of the inaugural Women's Tag Team Champions, and despite a handful of hiatuses, the boss finally had a reign to be proud of. This came after defeating best frenemy Bailey at Hell in a Cell for the SmackDown down women's title and ruling as champion for over 150 days. But while Sasha's booking has been inconsistent, let's just look at her accolades. Six-time world champion, two-time tag champion, first woman to headline a pay-per-view, first woman in a Hell in a Cell match, WrestleMania headliner, the lot. Number four, Becky Lynch. Well, Becky Lynch. She's quite popular, isn't she? The rise of the man was a long time coming, with Lynch enduring periods of bland storytelling and meaningless runs, despite being the inaugural SmackDown Women's Champion. And then, one stray punch from Nia Jax turned her into the biggest star in the industry overnight. So hot was Lynch that comparisons were made to the likes of Steve Austin, as she belittled, badgered, and beat everyone in her way and would not step down from anyone. With Ronda Rousey at the top of the division, a dream match was Set between the two and Charlotte Flair. And with both women's championships on the line, Becky and co became the first women to headline WrestleMania, with Lynch pinning Ronda to reign as double champ. And what a reign that was. After quickly dropping the SmackDown title, Becky clung to the Raw strap for nearly 400 days and became the face of WWE. Becky relinquished the title due to pregnancy in 2020 before coming back a year later to snatch the SmackDown women's title from Bianca Belair at SummerSlam, somehow getting
forcing the WWE Universe to boo her out the building. She since swapped it with Charlotte Flair for the Raw title and still very much has her perch at the top of the division. Number 3. Seth Rollins A former Ring of Honor World Champion, the first ever NXT Champion, it's safe to say that the wrestling world was Seth Rollins' oyster since day one and from his first day on the main roster to today, he has put his all into every situation. From the early domination of The Shield through The Architect, The Monday Night Messiah and whatever the hell he's doing with those suits these days, Rollins has been box office and is some sort of walking trophy cabinet. Four world titles, two IC titles, one US title, six tag titles, Money in the Bank, Rumble winner and most importantly nine slammies, Rollins has quite simply done it all and somehow managed to keep it fresh. And as for who he's beaten, take your pick from some of the biggest names in wrestling history, Triple H, Sting, John Cena, Brock Lesnar and everyone in between. Like many, many others in WWE, his storylines haven't always been great, Hell in a Cell vs The Fiend, we're looking at you, but Rollins has made the most of everything sent his way and is arguably the biggest workhorse of the entire company. Number 2. Charlotte One of the most polarizing stars in modern wrestling, Charlotte Flair is undeniably a generation talent. While yes, WWE seemingly bends over backwards to protect Flair at the cost of the rest of the women's division, what must be remembered is that although Charlotte is a 15-time champion, that also means she's dropped the title a hell of a lot of times as a result, and she most certainly isn't afraid of doing the J-O-B. Most of the time. Of course, there are myriad times when Flair shouldn't have prevailed, and her inclusion into the WrestleMania 35 main event seemed a tad forced, but the Queen delivers a every single time she gets in the ring. And although her detractors may roll their eyes, they cannot deny Flair's talent or ability. For all of Charlotte's title reigns across Raw and SmackDown, she hasn't held either belt for as long as you would think, with over 550 combined days from 12 reigns at the time of writing, one of the drawbacks of hot shotting. But as a Grand Slam winner, Triple Crown winner, 12-time Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion, 2-time NXT Champion, a Divas title run, a Women's Tag title run, and a Partridge in a pear tree, there is a reason that they call Charlotte the Queen. Number 1. Roman Reigns Whilst the rest of this top four could easily be swapped around any way you see fit, there is no debate that Roman Reigns is number one with a bullet. Even before his amazing run as WWE's Tribal Chief, Roman was the most successful NXT call-up ever, and it's not even close. Handpicked by WWE to be the face of the company, Reigns has had a love-hate relationship with the WWE fans as a result, but it was super strong booking mixed with truly terrible writing that caused the animosity. Break the Royal Rumble elimination record? Done. Defeat The Undertaker at WrestleMania? Completed it, pal. Win every title and never really be in peril? Checkmate. Say a load of unrelatable nonsense crap about suffering succotash. Unfortunately, yeah, that was him too. WWE stuck by their man though, and occasionally struck gold with face reigns, such as when he battered the McMahons and the League of Nations, or when a reformed shield came back to start dishing out naps. All the while, Reigns won title after 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 title. Then after a hiatus, Roman came back with an attitude, a chip on his shoulder, and Paul Heyman pulling the strings. The tribal chief has put it all together to truly become the biggest star in WWE. Believe that.